Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Weiss, and I work on leadership and team development as part of Google EDU. And today it is my pleasure to welcome Peter Sims to the Leading at Google series. Many of us are here today because we're familiar with Peter's last bestseller, True North, and the concept of authentic leadership. Peter co-authored True North with Bill George, who was previously featured as part of our series in 2008. Beyond his success as an author and entrepreneur, Peter received an MBA from Stanford Business School and continues to collaborate with the faculty at Stanford's Institute of Design, the D School. And Peter, we've got our eyes on you because he has written articles on the future of Google, which have appeared in Harvard Business Review and TechCrunch. Today, Peter will share from his latest book entitled Little Bets, How Breakthrough Ideas Emerge from Small Discoveries. Please join me in welcoming Peter Sims. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana, and for everyone for coming today. So let me give you a little bit of forewarning, though. This is one of the first presentations I've given on this new book, Little Bets. And so as, as the co-founder of Pixar puts it, Ed Catmulley says, their creative process is like going from suck to non-suck. So by the time this is run through 50 times, it'll be non-suck. Bear with me if it's a little bit, got a little rough edges here today, but it's a pleasure to be here and I really appreciate your time. The, you know, this, the, the book started with this sense that we all have, I think, or many of us have, this myth that exists, which is that we have to have a brilliant idea before we do something new. And this is just something, something I believed, it's something that was common when I was at Stanford. And the reality is, is that yes, there are people who are like Mozart, who, was able to come up with an entire composition of music in his own mind before he transcribed the music onto the paper. It was flawless. I mean, he would put it down literally completely on paper without having to make changes or, or any corrections, for the most part. This is what historians say. Now, Mozart was a prodigy. He was a genius. If you look at the research, these are very rare. What's much more common and, and far more relevant to, to all of us is the way somebody like Beethoven worked. Right? So Beethoven would have to work through iteration after iteration of his work, tirelessly, draft after draft. His transcripts would be marked with pockmarks and changes, some of them so deep that you could just tell his, his pen quill had gone through the paper. Right? So this, if you look at the research, is the far more common way that people create and innovate. And I had worked previously in venture capital, and I saw that most great entrepreneurs don't begin with brilliant ideas. They discover them. Right. So take, for example, Google. Google began as a library search project, as some of you probably know, and it became, evolved into what it became through numerous steps, right? Figure out the algorithm, get the whole process down for the business model, and over time, of course, becomes a brilliant idea. So it was discovered. The Starbucks vision that Howard Schultz had when he created Starbucks was to have a coffee experience in the United States, it was like Italy, right? Where he went to Milan, he, he loved the coffee experience there, he wanted to bring it back to the US, but the first stores that he opened, I mean, Howard Schultz is one of the best entrepreneurs of his generation, the first Starbucks had menus written in Italian, nonstop opera music playing, and no chairs. Can you believe that? So this is obviously very different than the Starbucks we experience today. But it just goes to show that the great entrepreneurs, at least in my experience, having met hundreds of them in the US and Europe, were the ones who were able to discover these great businesses and great ideas over time. And so this raises a question, well, if people who are really, really good at creativity are often discovering their ideas, then how do we learn how to think and work like that? So what I did for this book is work with a research team. We want to understand how do some of these masters work? How do they actually work inside their processes? Whether they're filmmakers at Pixar or comedians like Chris Rock or architect Frank Gehry or Steve Jobs, the way the design process work at, at Apple, or even people who were working as counterinsurgency strategists in the military. And what we found is that they all work using a surprisingly similar approach. And at the core of that approach are what I call these little bets. So for instance, when we see Chris Rock on HBO or on Letterman, he's flawless, right? I mean, he's perfect. 
But to get there, he spent night after night in small club after small club testing out his ideas to see what's going to work and what's not. And he can't predict. He comes in with ideas scribbled on sheets of paper. He can't predict what's going to work and what's not. He's Chris Rock. You'd think that he'd have this figured out, but he has to literally for six months to a year go into these small clubs until he's perfected a 60-minute act. Right? So what, what that puts a premium on is his ability to put himself out there, be willing to fail with these little bets night after night, fails thousands of times. And he'll get a break when he starts because he's Chris Rock, but pretty soon people want him to be good. Right? They want to see him lighting up the room. They want to see him in the full preacher effect, but he's, he's not able to do that. He's just, he's basically working and slogging through this material night after night. And this is how all stand-up comedians work. So what Rock has discovered is that ingenious ideas are rare, but what is brilliant is this creative process of discovery. And so if we think about what a little bet is, I define a little bet as just a small, achievable, affordable action that anyone can take to discover and develop ideas. And so it sounds very simple, but the question is, why don't more of us know how to do this well? And so we really focused a lot of the research on that. And I think the main reason is because of the way we're trained to think, right? From a young age, we're told to have answers. And there's a big emphasis on avoiding errors and mistakes. And that's not the way the world works, right? This is, I kid you not, an actual slide from the US Army to show what the Afghanistan strategy was last year. Now this slide was presented by the staff to General Stanley McChrystal. And when McChrystal saw this slide, right, it seems simple, right? It's all pretty, makes sense. What don't you understand? When McChrystal saw this slide, his response was, when we understand that slide, we will have won the war, right? Because I mean, it's just, you can't, this is the problem. You can't plan for situations like the Middle East. They don't even know what the problems are gonna be when they go into Iraq or Afghanistan. They go into a new town. And so if you try to put it all on one PowerPoint slide, like we've been training, you know, have the answer up front before you figure out all the problems, then you know, generals like McChrystal or some of the other leading counterinsurgency strategists say just don't even use PowerPoint. You know, so this is the problem that we are confronting, and as Jeff Bezos will say, you can't put into Excel how people are gonna to respond to a new product, right? So, so you have to kind of take a step back from this relentless desire that we have to plan and to have perfect ideas, and really think about in new or uncertain situations how we can flip a switch from doing that to discovery. And so here's the first HP calculator. This is the HP 35. This came out in 1972 and was projected to cost $400. At the time, that was $2,000 or so these days. Now, the alternative was inexpensive slide rules. So what HP did is the logical thing. They went out and did market research. They hired SRI and they said, let us know what you think about this product. So they went out and did all the market research and SRI came back and said, this thing can't sell. Pure and simple, this thing can't sell. But Bill Hewlett, co-founder of Hewlett Packard, had just been on a plane the previous day with a guy who he was talking with the whole time and, and he showed him this calculator and he said, here, what do you think? You know? And so the guy looked at the calculator and he said, after I don't know how many hours of conversation, he said, you know, I, I'd buy one. And so Hewlett said, you know, this guy would buy one, why don't we just make a thousand and see what happens? Which is what they did. And within five months, HP was selling a thousand of these a day. It was the fastest growing product in HP's history, right? Now, what Hewlett did and what great entrepreneurs do is when they're doing something new, they flip the switch from planning, this planning mindset, trying to project the future outcome, and he thought about what he could afford to lose instead. So he's willing to afford putting a thousand calculators out there. He knew he couldn't know all the answers up front. And so from that, he learns, right? So again, this is how this Little Bets idea begins to, to, to manifest itself. We, we think of Little Bets as 
being used to develop opportunities where you're trying to understand what the problems are, where you're trying to, to develop those ideas through this discovery process, and then you make the big bets when you actually know what the problems are. And so just to visualize it, this is how to, to break it down. In order, though, to discover something new, when you're in the unknown and you have to go through this rapid iteration of, of trying ideas, you know, HP and Bill Hewlett couldn't have predicted that the calculator was going to break out. They had to do lots of these little tests to see where their, the needs were for the people they were serving. And they had to do this through, through time to kind of develop the ideas. The calculator was kind of a lucky exception. But in order to be able to do this well, we have to be willing to be imperfect. We have to be willing to fail, right? And so this is, again, something that we're not rewarded from a young age for doing. And so the question is, if you're doing comedy, this is some statistics from The Onion, it takes them 600 possibilities to come up with 18 new headlines, 3% success rate every week. Now, I know there's at least one Canadian here who happens to be a friend, so I feel comfortable putting this headline up. But it's, this is a roughly the same success rate that it would take stand-up comedians to develop new material, right? So they have to put, you have to put yourself out there a lot. You have to try a lot of possibilities to get to something that's great, right? So same is true for the way Bill Hewlett thought about small bets. He said that for us to get at those six ideas that are going to be great, we have to put ourselves out there through 100 small bets. And this is how HP was able to come up with it. the first computer, actually. It started when people who were engineers working on the lines just couldn't keep up with the output for some of HP's readout machines. And so they said, well, let's put in something to help them figure that out. The first HP computer started as a little bit again tying like these problems and needs that people have with possibilities. But it takes a lot of this iteration to get there. OK, so that's something that you all do well. This is something that Google is known for doing, you know, making lots of little bets. And so, but the interesting thing is that whether or not we are comfortable with imperfection and failure is a highly personal thing. I mean, we're all at different stages. But there's really encouraging news, and that is that the mindset for developing comfort with failure and setbacks can be developed. And so to learn about this, we talk with Dr. Carol Dweck, who's a professor up at Stanford. Some of you may know of Carol's work. She's a social psychologist, one of the leading social psychologists in the country. And her research for the past two decades has been on studying how different people respond to failure and setbacks and why certain people are very comfortable with it and certain people aren't. And what she's found is that there are two basic, what she calls mindsets. And we're all on a spectrum here. So on one side of the spectrum is what she calls the fixed mindset. And so a fixed mindset is if somebody has a very strong fixed mindset, they believe that their intelligence or their abilities or their talents are fairly set in stone that they can't be changed. And on the other side of the spectrum are people who have what she calls a growth mindset, which is that they feel like, well, if they're not good at something initially, they'll just get better through effort. And so her, one of her favorite examples of somebody with a fixed mindset is John McEnroe. You know, every time McEnroe, people with a fixed mindset believe that, since they believe their, their talents and their abilities are fixed, any threat to that is something they shy away from because they don't want to be seen as dumb or as less than capable if it's, if it's an athletic talent. So John McEnroe, obviously, every time he was threatened by setbacks, would just blame everyone in sight for problems. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, people with a growth mindset are people like Michael Jordan, who got cut from his high school basketball team, was a you know, terrible three-point shooter when he got into the pros, and over time, through exerting lots of practice and effort, he got better. OK, so there's a lot of research out there on this deliberate practice, deliberate effort to get better and develop your talents. But what Dweck finds is that the people with fixed mindset tend to avoid challenges, tend to avoid any obstacles, or, or, or believe that they can get better with effort. So she started by studying school kids. And if school kids didn't do on a test, they, if they had a fixed mindset, wouldn't want to take the test again because they didn't want their abilities to be they didn't want their talent to be threatened, their, their perception to be threatened. Whereas people with a growth mindset, if they didn't do on a test, they took the te wanted to take the test again. So what she found is that with, with kids, the key factor is, comes down to praise, how you're praised when you're a child. 
or how you praise your kids. And so if you praise your child for their abilities and the external achievements that they have, like grades or, or athletic success, then they're much more likely to gravitate towards a fixed mindset where that becomes the most important determinant of their, of their worth. Whereas people with a growth mindset, if you're really emphasizing the effort, then that's what they focus on. And so as they grow older, they realize that if they're not doing well at something, that they're just going to be able to get better at it over time by exerting more effort, right? So the people we interviewed, over 200 innovators, had strong growth mindsets. But people like Chris Rock, they believed that if they just put themselves out there, they could get better at whatever they were doing. Now, the really encouraging news is that Dweck says this growth mindset can be developed. And the way it can be developed, one of the main ways it can be developed, is by actually doing things, by actually putting yourself out there into these situations that may not be comfortable at first, but then seeing over time a pattern of improvement through effort, the growth mindset tends to expand. So that's one foundational element that, that we write about in the book. And then the second is that you need to obviously be able to think big when you're doing something new but start small and fail fast. So this is familiar to, people, to the culture here, um, but it also is familiar to people who work across a lot of other areas who may not realize work like this. So Frank Geary, for example, when he starts a new building project, will literally crumple up sheets of paper and cardboard and tape them together with duct tape, even working with this small team of people. And what he's trying to do very quickly is just get started. Just, he, he says he has a healthy insecurity when he begins something new, which surprised me because he's the most famous architect in the world. But he says every time before he begins a project, he's afraid he's going to fail. So he says the thing that makes a big difference is when he actually starts, does, does the initial model. And he'll work through anywhere from 40 to 80 of these models for every project. But what they're trying to do is figure out, working with their clients, what direction to go in. And so this is the same way that Pixar would work to develop a film. They would use, they use what they call storyboards. And so what they do very early before they spend time animating a movie is they lay it all out in the, with these hand-drawn storyboards. And they're really trying to figure out how the initial characters are going to work. So this is a picture actually of, of Woody from Toy Story. The initial Toy Story, Woody was mean. He was actually a mean character. And it wasn't working. So they had to go back and fix it so that he was more likable, and this all happened during the, the early stage, the first stage. And then, so they'll spend, if it's five years on a movie, they'll spend the first two years developing the story, because if they get the story right, then the rest of it can flow. So that's roughly speaking how much time they'll spend on that early failing quickly to learn fast phase. And so this is something, obviously, you know, agile software development, lean software development, minimum viable product, it's all the same way of, of working. The, the next thing that, to realize, though, is it's not, it's not a chaotic process for these people. So Frank Geary's a great example. I mean, he will work through each model with certain constraints. And so these can include time constraints, budgetary constraints, regulatory constraints. He figures all that out first, and then each model he develops, they actually scan with a digital pen. And they, they scan that into a, a computer software program that says, okay, this is what this model this is how this model compares to your budget. And so if they're going over budget, they'll have to just trim off a, a wing of a building and, and, and go back to the drawing board with the model. So they're very disciplined and constantly measuring. And so Geary calls these guardrails, right? And so this is critical for anybody to be able to, to develop you know, their box, if you will, as they're going through the creative process. And the, in the constraints, though, the point is that they just, they develop these up front and, and measure their progress over time these, with these parameters. And this is a picture of the, the, how it would come out in the model for Frank Gehry. This is, again, what he calls guardrails. Uh, the, next, the next piece, that, though, is very important to, to learn is that the best ideas are out in the world. If you look across the research, and if you look at the people we interviewed, they think that questions are the new answers. And so what I mean by that is that when people from the military go into a new city or a new town in Iraq or Afghanistan, one of the first things they do is they sit down and they have tea with tribal leaders. They act like anthropologists, right? They're trying to understand what's the local power structure. 
They're trying to understand where are the problems. They don't even know where the problems are when they get there. So they want to understand where the problems are, where the, where the you, you can think of the al Qaeda as being the bad guys, but the, the, the spectrum of good to bad is much more nuanced than that. They can't even really tell who the enemies are. So they have to, through these really immersive conversations, understand that, begin to understand that. And then they'll move in to a city and actually live in the population. Now, this is the same way that people at Pixar will develop their ideas. They'll, they'll go out before a new movie and they'll do lots of research. So this is a picture taken from up. And as you'll see, the, the guy who's in the middle with the beard is Bob Peterson. He's been at Pixar for a while. And how many of you have seen the movie Up? Oh, everyone, well, virtually everyone. That's amazing. Pixar will be thrilled to know that. The, the, the character Doug, the dog, constantly looks for the squirrel, you know, always going darting his head for squirrel. The idea for that came from Bob Peterson literally getting on his hands and knees with his dogs and just noticing how dogs reacted when there was a noise, any noise, that they would just dart their head this way or that way. So, so this is where the insights and ideas tend to come from for anything that's the newer creative material for, for the small bets. And so the, there was a huge study done on how creative executives work. And what they found is that what distinguished the innovators from the non-innovators was that the innovators asked many, many questions. The inquisitiveness was the main thing that stood out that distinguished the innovators from the non-innovators. And so these are people like Jobs and Jeff Bezos and, and A.G. Laffley and Diane Green of, of, of VMware. And so they asked a lot of questions and they, they constantly were open to possibilities by asking things like, instead of just why, what if, or why not? These are key questions. Again, people who work with Bezos say that this is one of the things that they find distinguishes him from, from other people at that level. So questions are the new answers. And then, again, just thinking about how to step out of these paradigms that we get ingrained from such an early age through all of our educational process. The successful creative possibilities tend to get ginned up for people when they're not inhibited, right? when they're not censoring or judging their ideas. So there's been a ton of neuroscience research done on this. And what they found is that for people who are placed in an MRI machine and asked to play two different types of music. On the one hand, they're, they're asked to play structured C-scale music. And on the other hand, they're asked to play improvised jazz music. When they're allowed to play that improvised jazz music, the part of their brain in the front, frontal area that is responsible for judging self is actually deactivated. So this being able to just improvise ideas literally Oh, it decreases the innovation in the part of your brain that's judging, which is really important. So this ability to be playful, this ability to not judge ideas initially at the early stages of developing ideas is critical. And we don't ever learn these skills in school, but the, they can be learned. And, and if you look at how Frank Gehry will do this with his team, he, he says it's just really important to be able to play with his team as a, at their early stages. And, and Pixar is the same way. So what they do is at Pixar, they use techniques directly out of improv to develop new ideas. And they call it plussing. And the way it works is if somebody were to say to you, I th here's how I think Woody should look in this scene. And you would have the sketch drawn out and they'd take it to the director. The director would say, instead of saying, yes, I like that idea, but what if, but what if we did this and judged it? It would obviously just deflate the positive energy. So what they do is they say, yes, and. Right? This is a technique directly from improvised improv comedy. Yes and, so they accept every offer and then they make it better. So yes and, make it better. They call it plussing and it truly flows throughout the culture there. Um, now, people who I interviewed throughout Silicon Valley had another term to think about the opposite way of thinking about this. It's, a number of you heard of the hippo phenomenon? Certainly a few of you have. Now, the hippo phenomenon is something that I actually learned here um, with reference to other people. And that is when hippo phenomenon is highest paid person's opinion rules, right? So this is how most people make decisions in groups or in organizations. 
the hippo phenomenon. And of course what that does is th that person is often completely disconnected from where the problems actually are, where the insights actually are. But this is, if, if you look and think about like the Pixar approach, the plussing approach, it's kind of the anti-hippo phenomenon. Right? How do you take and build up ideas uh, in a collaborative way? This is really how they do it. This is kind of the secret sauce is, is this plussing. Now, another thing that emerges in the research is that chance or luck tends to favor the open mind. And so there's, this is a picture of Dr. Richard Weissman, who is at, uh, in the UK, he studies luck and he has for decades. And what he's found in studying and comparing lucky people to unlucky people is that the lucky people tend to be much less rigid in the way they take in information and the way they interact with other people. Okay, so for example, he, he did an experiment where he put a newspaper together and he asked people to count how many photos are in this newspaper. And people would go through and, and look, and on the second page was a half page ad that said, stop counting, there are 60 pictures in the paper. Now, the unlucky people missed that, almost entirely missed that, whereas the lucky people caught it. And then if you went further into the paper, it would had, had another ad that said, stop counting, collect your 250 pounds. Again, the, 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 the unlucky people missed that as well. So Weissman's point is that unlucky people tend to be just so focused on what they're trying to do personally that they miss things that are going on around them all the time. So he, he looks at this in a social setting. He says, if you go to a party and you're interacting with people at a party, the unlucky people tend to socialize with people who are most like them, people who have similar academic backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds, whereas the, the lucky people interacted with people who were you know, any, very open. They had something like three times greater body language. They were, they were just very receptive to having these more extroverted conversations. And so what Weissman's found, and it's, it's, a, it's a finding that has held up well, is that you know, luck is something that can be learned. Again, this is important just when you think about where creativity comes from, where innovation comes from. These are the types of things that we don't learn in school and that we, we don't really condition ourselves for through our experiences, but that can be developed and learned. So ultimately, we need to go through, as you do here, tireless iteration to develop ideas. Right? I mean, that's, this, is, this is the reality of how creativity works, of how innovation works, despite the fact that what we see is this beautiful finished end product. And so what, what they use are these small wins to build up ideas. Rather than starting with the idea, they, they use small wins to build up the ideas. So the way that the military folks talk about this is consolidating gains. So they'll get control of a block, and then they'll take another block, and they'll take another block, and they use these small wins to piece together what will be the ultimate solution. Uh, this is exactly what Geary does. He works through each model. He's working to develop a certain part of the building to get a little bit closer to the end, end result, to the end goal. And the same would be true of, of Pixar, Chris Rock, or, or entrepreneurs. I mean, that's really how you have to, that's really how you have to work when you're, when you're starting something up from, from, from the start. And so this is actually the process that I went through. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to show you this because it's so shitty, but it's, the first PowerPoint slide I put together to try to figure out if I should work on this book. This was, you know, I, I wasn't sure if it would be worth the time. I wanted to do something very quick, very dirty, put it in front of people. So I ended up taking this slide and sharing it with family and friends and people I'd met uh, who I trusted. And one of the people I showed this to was Ned Barnholt, who was a senior executive at Hewlett Packard. And he looked at this slide and he said, and I don't even understand the slide when I look at it now. I mean, it just doesn't, it's, I'm embarrassed. I, I'm especially embarrassed it has a copyright sign at the bottom of the page. But the, what he said is, he said, this reminds me of something that I learned when I was at HP, and that is we used to make these big bets on big ideas. And we'd spend millions and millions of dollars on these big bets. And, you know, at the end of the day, we planned it out, we thought we had everything going for us, and we weren't solving the right problems for these intangible factors, right? They, they basically just weren't connected closely enough with, with the need. And he said, that's where I learned to make a lot of little bets. So I literally just scribbled that 
phrase down, and then uh, what I, is I, I put together a three-page overview that I showed to people who were other authors or people who were literary agents. Again, just trying to figure out very quickly if I should be going down this path. And again, this title is terrible. Again, I don't, I really would like for you to just keep that between us. Like, but this is what I showed people and they said the subtitle, it, the little bets in the subtitle jumped out at them. They said that that's just a great phrase. That's a great idea. And I said, well, I, I think it's cool too. And so what I did is I said, you know, it's basically very core to what I was saying. So I moved it up into the title of this three page document. And, you know, literally after having many people tell me that this was this, going from this, where many people told me this was stupid, to this, all of a sudden people, every agent wanted to work on it. Everybody said, that's a big idea. And I was sort of surprised, I mean, but much like, I'm very surprised by this, really. Yeah, I mean, I like it, I think it's great. It's core to what I'm, what I'm passionate about and what I'm trying to, to research here. And that changed everything. So all of a sudden, people are saying, oh, this is the most creative thing in the world. And I never thought of myself as creative, ever, since I got like, a C in my art class in seventh grade. But the process is where the genius lies. And so that's, if there's one thing I would hope that you take from this, uh, that genius is overrated. And that really, at the end of the day, all this can be learned. But we have to change the way we think. We have to think differently. We've been taught and conditioned in one way, and all the research that I've looked at, and we've did an exhaustive, exhaustive amount for this book, shows that the, f the switch can be flipped. And it begins with these little bets. So I thank you all very much for coming in and, and listening to this, and I would love to hear some questions, but also hope that you go back and make a little bet soon. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So please, I would love to hear any questions. Yeah, the, so the question was, at the outset it said that the talk goes from suck to non-suck, just like the book itself went from suck to non-suck. I mean, literally, I'll give, I'll give you an example of like, first of all, the talk will evolve tremendously based on what you learn through the process. And speaking is, is something that you learn as you go if you talk with anybody who's ever done any public speaking. It's just a, an ongoing process. But the book itself, I literally used every chapter has a different way of thinking and approaching creativity. I used every single chapter and every single principle at each step of the process. I mean, including, there's a lot of research that shows, for example, that if you go to the most active users of an idea, people like book agents or authors, that they're the ones who are gonna be best suited to help you figure out if you're solving the right problem early. So, I mean, that was one example, but I mean, even just, the, the book begins with the story of Chris Rock and how he works. And this is something I blogged about, I went out and talked with people about across all these different demographics that could take in the book. And it was amazing that it just the consistent feedback was that this story worked, whether it was my dad reading it, or a CEO, or somebody who was just you know, a librarian. And so that, that story was the centerpiece of the book, and, and, and the feedback has been great on that as the lead for the book. And you know, now the process will repeat with the talk, you know, to see, see, what, piece, see what pieces work, and, and, and to constantly be uh, iterating as you go. Yeah, no thanks. Sure. Two directions. Oh, thanks. There's two directions you can go with that, right? You can make lots of uh, little bets, sort of all over the place, uh, kind of a breath-based approach, right. and you can um, you can make a lot of little bets uh, along one or just a few approaches, you know, like a depth-first uh, approach. So, uh, how do you make that decision? What which direction would you go? Right. What, what did you find? Well, I think you know I say think big, and and really by that I mean like whether Frank Gehry's starting a building project or Pixar starting a film, like they have, they have a, a vision for where they want to go, right? They know that they want, Gary knows, for example, at Disney Hall, that he wanted that experience to, to be the best listening experience for people the, of any building in the world. 
So when people got there, his whole vision was, well, they, he wanted to have the orchestra be able to hear each other so that they could connect with the audience and so that the audience would give feedback that was positive to the orchestra. All that was driven by his desire to create, that, that was his mission. And then what would accomplish that was to have you know, the best acoustics in the world. So I think it's critical to like have a very strong vision or end in mind as clearly as you can have it, and then to use constraints to be the, you know, the guardrails towards getting there. What's in between is a, there's a lot of mystery in between, and that's what you figure out with little bets. Sure. Did you interview or speak with anybody that had previously considered themselves non-innovative and had sort of figured out they either needed to change their mindset or change their process and sort of a transformation towards being more creative? Uh, I think that happens for a lot of people. The people we interviewed, I'm trying to think of, of a specific person. I mean, I feel that way very strongly, obviously. I've, I've shared that. Um, you know, I've, I've, a lot of the people who have come through the, the Stanford D School have had that experience where the D School teaches a lot of these methods such around rapid prototyping and, and, and doing careful observation and, and doing the immersion, all those types of things. And people come out of that experience, for example, you know, Ryan Jacoby, who you know, and, and feel completely differently about their ability to create. And so the people who are kind of, you know, being educated clearly have that switch that's flipped. For, for people like Frank Geary, you know, it's very interesting. He, Geary, for many years, developed buildings that were pretty conventional. He did shopping malls, he did tract homes, and he was 50 years old, around 50, and somebody, and he was, he started experimenting on his house in Santa Monica, actually. So he'd been spending time with artists, and they had inspired him to use different materials to create ideas, and especially you know, for him to use like steel or metals to, to create buildings. And so he literally built a, a house around his house using all these kind of corrugated pieces of metal. And, and people saw this and they said, you know, Frank, why are you still making these conventional buildings? And he couldn't answer the question. So he decided to close down his firm, even though it was very profitable and to start anew. And he's now 80 years old, so he kind of opened up this completely new voice, if you will, of, uh, of what he's ultimately become known for at a pretty late age. Pretty amazing. Hey, sure. so uh, I just read a, another book recently called uh, The Social Animal from uh, David Brooks, I think. And uh, one, one point that I saw him hitting there, and it seems that you hit the same point of uh, analytical thinking being too overrated and the power of, I, I would say, like what he calls unconscious uh, on decision making. And do you see this connecting to what you're seeing as well, that little bets, in fact, is kind of a counterpoint to, oh, if you have all the data, everyone should come to the same conclusion. But the fact is, perhaps you're not going to have always all the data. And then the right. best way is just put it out there and kind of have that collective intelligence judge on decisions you're making. Precisely. I mean, that's precisely it. And that's the contrast between this desire to plan and think we have to have it all figured out up front. With, the point is we don't know what we don't know when we're doing something new. And so we're really good at taking information we have and making decisions using analysis and knowledge. But we're really bad at creating knowledge, right? which is what Little Bets does. Is like it allows you to gain a much more insight or data to be able to make a better decision, right? So that's precisely what, what Little Bets gets at. So when you try new ideas, small ideas, and you were saying that uh, you're gonna fail in many of those, right. what are the key indicators that you will get out of an idea to say, yes, this is something that I'm gonna keep pushing for, as opposed to saying I'm failing and these key indicators are not there, so I'm just gonna abandon the, this idea? Well, that's, I think, where constraints come in to, to be able to figure out early two things. One, which you can afford to lose, 
right? What you can afford, what's achievable for you, and that's going to be very different than for me or for, for other people in the room. Or So that's one thing that's really important. And then the second thing is to use, to, to, to just delineate constraints, how much time you're going to allocate to that up front so that you can constantly measure your progress constraints. It could include budget, it could include lots of different things. But the combination of those two things help guide the process, right? Those are your parameters to guide the process. And then I think it becomes, you know, very much an individual decision from there on how to, whether to, to double down on something and keep going, pursuing, or not. I mean, and, you know, it's, it's an individual decision. Um, in, this uh, makes me think a little bit of that quote, um, success is 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. Right. Um, yeah. So um, you had that one slide in there where people went from kind of the little bet discovery mode and flipping the switch to the big bet planning. Right. Um, how uh, is that a hard transition to make or o only in retrospect do you see that you flipped the switch a little bit or um, when do those little bets become Big bets. How how easy is it to see or get to that transition? Well, it depends on the, the the type of problem or the type of idea. But I mean, in the case of of me deciding whether to write this book, once all the agents thought it was interesting, and the editors thought it was interesting, and there was clearly an I'd clearly hit a, a new need or a new market, then that that's where I decide. Well, that's worth me betting much bigger on. Um, so there was evidence coming back that you're constantly evaluating, data that you're constantly evaluating, and insight that you're constantly evaluating. Um, for, the, for, for entrepreneurs, I think, if they're able to get money from something, that's obviously a key sign that they should double down and bet more. Um, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's other people, you know, if it's a comedian like Chris Rock, if he's got a joke that's working consistently across audiences, he knows that he can, if he goes to you know, somewhere in the Midwest, he goes somewhere in Long Island and he goes somewhere in the South and it's working in all these places, which is what he does, then he knows that he's ready to go on HBO. Um, so it depends on, on what your goal is and, and you know, what audience you're trying to, to get at with that idea. But a lot of this book is about how to develop ideas with an audience in mind. You know, so eventually commercialize it, basically. So. Was it you had the same question? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, it was a similar question to what was asked earlier. I think I think like the key is um, like we have teams that make lots of little bets, and uh, one thing I'm wondering is like, how do you know when to abandon those little bets, right? Like. Right. The, okay. The, so this is a great question. This is a philosophical question that's worth answering. It. I think. You know, nobody does anything great unless they have a lot of conviction in their idea. And, and this has been the case for, you know, products that haven't gone here, right? I mean, the, I mean, or haven't gone huge here, right? I mean, the reader team. You know what I mean? Like, I don't mean to pick out paper. But, you know, like, but if you don't have that fundamental belief in the idea, and if you're not willing to run through a fire for it, then you don't have that vision, you don't have that inspiration, right? And so then, you know, the decision is going to be made by on, on an individual level. It's really on an individual level and it gets into the question of when do you pivot or when do you stick to an idea, right? I mean, this is a question that I haven't heard anybody answer in a way that's generalizable, convincingly. And so, but, but if you look at how a company like Pixar came about, it started as a hardware company. You know, Steve Jobs thought it was going to be a great hardware company when he bought it, bought it for $10 million. Then it became a software company. And the way it became a film company was by making little bets on short films on the side and by them getting enough traction in short films to be able to sell commercials, again, to be able to monetize what they were doing. So they have evidence, they have data that suggests that there's, they're tapping into a need. They're tapping into a new problem. I think one of the things that, that's a challenge is a big problem is that a lot of people will get very passionate or convinced about an idea that's not actually solving a problem for the world, right? And so that's where 
you know, you'd hope that in an organizational context, there's some feedback saying, okay, this is crazy. I know you're passionate about this, this idea or this particular technology, but we have to think about like, who's on the other end of the phone, right? You know, so that's a big part of what I write about is starting with the, the insights that you can get from the end user like Hewlett got by ha having that conversation with the person on the tank, having that immersive experience, those immersive experiences then cycle back into the bets that you make. So I'd say it's a very personal, it's a very personal decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.